seven as senator, once as vice president, I have placed my hand on our family Bible and sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. As Tom and others here will tell you, it's boilerplate when people hear it. Not the moment you place your hand on that Bible. The Constitution on Constitution Day is a day established to reflect on the meaning of the Constitution and recommit to upholding those ignobling phrases and principles outlined in the Constitution. And as all you know, from the very beginning, those phrases were debated. They were debated as to what they meant by the very signatories of that document immediately after it was ratified. We saw at the very beginning, because so much of what was at stake in this experiment for the new republic, those of you who studied the period, a bitter debate, a bitter debate. The historian, Ron Chernow recently noted, and I quote, however hard it may be to picture the founders resorting to rough and tumble tactics, there was nothing genteel about the politics at the nation's outset. For sheer verbal savagery, the founding era may have surpassed anything we've seen even today, end of quote. Thomas Jefferson wrote President Washington that a fellow cabinet member, Andrew Hamilton's financial proposal were, quote, flowed from principles adverse to liberty and was calculated to undermine and demolish this very republic. He also did. Thomas Paine published an open letter calling George Washington, quote, a hypocrite in public life and asking whether he abandoned good principles or whether he ever had any. <laughs> I can go on and on and on. But the point I'd like to make is that the true accomplishment of our founders was not that they spoke with one voice, but rather that out of many voices they forged a compact that has steered our nation safely through more than two centuries of incredible challenges and change making us the oldest democracy in the world. That is the genius of the document. My law professors, some of them rolling over in their grave and others lived to watch it, were amazed that I wrote a book on and taught constitutional law for over 20 years. And what I taught for those 20 years, and I practiced Chairman of the Judiciary Committee and the Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee for all those years, was the doctrine of separation of powers. It's the essence. It's the essence of what the Constitution is about. That and the doctrine of federalism. According to James Madison's account, Governor Morris of New York, at the opening of the Constitutional Convention, stated that he came to the convention as a representative of the whole human race. Somewhat, how can I say it? Self-congratulatory, you would say at the time. I can imagine, right, Ralph Bedlight, what your former colleagues would write about a senator or congressman who showed up and said anything remotely like that. The truth of it was, he was right. The whole human race, he said, would be affected by the proceedings of this convention. Morris further recognized that, quote, the country must be united. If persuasion does not unite it, the sword will. The stronger party will then make traitors of the weaker, and the gallows of the whole finish the work of the sword. But the founders also knew something else. They knew that the questions that they wrestled with then would not be settled by the words of the Constitution, but could be settled by the institutions 
to which the Constitution gave rise and power. The intense dialogue and even disagreement about the meaning of the Constitution has tended to focus on the very questions at the center of our national and political life today. Questions about the proper role of the federal government, about the rights that belong to the people, free from any government intrusion, about the rights, if there is one in many people's minds, of privacy. Basic, basic, basic questions. When I would teach law students, I would suggest to them that most of them arrived at the decision to go to law school because they were looking for certitude. That's what sends most people to law school. Thinking that there is, like a Napoleonic code, there are clear answers to specific questions. Put in the facts, in the right hole, in the right cubby hole, and you'll get the right answer. But I would immediately point out to them, that certainly, certainly, you don't look to become a philosopher for certitude. But as a law student, you tend to think you can find it there. But as they soon found out with my not having to tell them, and I learned this, I learned this most vividly from my professors. The Constitution doesn't provide certainty provides principles, institutions, mechanisms for solving problems, but not the solutions themselves. There has been a debate over the ennobling phrases of the Constitution from the very beginning. The founders didn't expect that phrases setting forth broad principles of general welfare, concepts like liberty, free from being able to be eavesdropped upon. They had no idea how they would play out in any specific sense over the ensuing centuries. How could they have known when they wrote the Fourth Amendment that there'd be eavesdropping devices that could be used like a rifle aim through a window or a wall at an incredible distance that could pick up the detail of one's conversation. No one had to enter your domicile to steal your records. And what the court has done is taken that principle and distilled it in layman's terms to the notion you're entitled the right of privacy in the Fourth Amendment right has been violated in any circumstance where there is not a general expectation that what you're saying and doing should be private. There's no expectation of privacy when you're in a movie theater and you turn to your friend and you say, I killed Cock Robin. The person behind you hear it, hears it. But there is an expectation of privacy. There is an expectation of privacy. You're talking on a telephone without probable cause on the part of the government to wiretap that phone. What does the concept of liberty mean in the 14th Amendment? We've been debating that since it was passed, one of the Civil War Amendments. We're still debating it today, particularly as it applies to the right of a woman to choose. What does it mean? Find me the definition of the Constitution. It does not exist, except in the ennobling principles that underline the notion. The Constitution, as Chief Justice Edward Douglas White said nearly a century ago, was never intended as a barrier to progress. That's what Dr. Ingersoll taught me. It was never intended as a barrier to progress. Rather, he said it was a broad highway through which progress, or that through which alone true progress may be enjoyed. 